Good morning, and thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Butts Chester. You know what I want to do on the show. I want to enlighten, inspire, and empower you to become your best self. No scripture reminds us that the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And today we are talking about 10 steps to provide a more successful childhood experience for your child. And who doesn't want to give their kids the very best? I know that I sure would. Now, my guest today is Bonnie Nelson, and she has written the book, I Found Myself in 11th Grade, and I Found I Wasn't Alone. So let me tell you a little bit more about Bonnie. She is a motivational speaker on self-awareness and the power of knowing yourself. She is an avid reader and also the author of four illustrated books for elementary school-aged children, including two novels for young adults, Principles and Examples to Help People Learn. Now, of course, a funny story always sticks in the mind, which is a great way to remember important concepts. Working for eight years on a psych ward taught the author many things about human nature and the power of accurate thought and skill assessment to regain momentum for living. Combined with a spattering of faith, which can also breathe life into it all. I found myself in 11th grade and I found I wasn't alone. There's a novel which is currently available online. Of course, you can get it at Amazon. I'm always going to bring you authors where you can at least get it on Amazon. But this book is about a young man who lost the path he was on after his sister died. Depression and anxiety is a part of some students' lives. And we know that, and our students are definitely crying out. Well, that was the case for Angel. Um, She could say that faith was blowing in the wind that day Angel met Trooper Hawkins. The same wind pushed Robbie back onto the life path created just for him. Now, her other book, Gracie Girl Into Africa, soon to be released, is an adventure novel for young women aged 16 to 21. Now, you know what I'm about to tell you. Go on, get comfy, get cozy, get your coffee, and get your tea, because we are about to get started. Good morning, Bonnie. Thank you so much for joining me on Daily Spark with Dr. Angela today. Thank you, Dr. Angela. It's a blessing and delight to be with you today. Thank you so much. Now, I love that you are talking not only to our kids, but you are writing books that are for our young adults as well. So many times our young adults, our teens to, you know, college-age folk, they kind of get left out a little bit. So uh, thank you so much for including them as well in your upcoming series. Now, 10 steps to providing a more successful childhood experience for your child. What made you decide that you wanted to talk about such a topic? Well, because I found that when you're a child and your parent isn't doing the thing that you really need to set you on the course of your life, it can have devastating effects. And so parents are, you know, many shapes and sizes, but my whole hope is that parents will learn and have a toolkit that can help them see which each child has the potential for, and then be able to help usher that child onto their given path that will take them to success in their own life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, someone may be asking, how do I know if my child was born with great potential? Well, all children are like seeds, and that's a very good question, Dr. Angela, but if there was any one analogy, that would be it. All children are like seeds, and seeds grow into fragrant and beautiful flowers, but no two flowers are exactly alike, just like no two children are really exactly alike. And any farmer will tell you that seeds take consistent care to sprout, grow, and flourish. And any gardener knows that it's not only the only thing required, but you have to keep the weeds out of the garden so that the flower may grow to its fullest potential. I think that's a very simple analogy of what it is to raise a child to be their own potential. Mm-hmm. And you really you you hit the nail on the head the nail 
people in the head there because that's the example that I use as well, be it that we are um, counseling with parents before they're doing a baptism or christening of their child or if we're doing um, a family therapy session. It's just if you want to be the best gardener you can be, you have to work on you first in order to pour into your children. So I have to agree with you on that. Now, some people will say, well, you know, I appreciate your book, but who knows my child better than I do? What would you say to the parent who's kind of on the line as to whether or not they want to pick up a copy? Well, any woman woman who's been pregnant can usually tell you in some way I got to know him while he was in the womb. And God even told Jeremiah in the International Standard Version that I knew you before I formed you in the womb and I set you apart before you were born. And yes, God knows your child and you as a teenage mother, a mother of a teenager, you know, you may find yourself even asking God like I did, please tell me what I need to do. And I'm talking mm-hmm. about strong-willed children. Right, those strong-willed children who seem to think they know more than the parent. And when I think about what it takes to help a strong-willed child, is really a different skill set than what you need to do to help a child who is more of an introvert, more of a follower, not a leader. So right away we see that there's two different types of parenting that you may need to do within your own family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, someone may be saying, and, and you kind of touched on the difference between being, you know, an extrovert and an introvert, someone who has a strong will child and someone who has a child who's a little bit more of a follower. What if there's a parent saying, you know, I don't know which one my child is. My child is kind of outgoing, but I do find that there's this one kid that they seem to just kind of literally follow around, but yet my child has... Um, their opinions about things. How do we know the difference Absolutely. between strong-willed and not? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a little tough when they're toddlers, right, because toddlers sort of group together and they're just forming who they are. But once your children are school age and they start to go to school, their ideals start to take a more um, – concrete form that you're going to start to see. But even in the very beginning, when you bring that baby home from the hospital and he's all swaddled up nice and tight, well, if he's kicking his legs out of that swaddling and you can hardly keep that child wrapped, I got news for you, that's a strong-willed child. And if your child just lays there snuggling, enjoying, oh, mom, this is so nice, I love this blanket, that's a child with a temperament who is more easy, right? So there's three temperaments of children, the easy child, the slow to warm child, and then the difficult child. And I'm sorry to say that many times the child labeled difficult is, guess what, the strong-willed child. Mm -hmm. And doesn't strong-willed sound so much better than difficult? Mm Mm-hmm. 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 And it is important, the labels that we use when we are addressing not only our own children, but other people's children as well. We want people to be receptive to what we're, we're trying to um, arm them with as opposed to being defensive and, and not being able to hear uh, the information that you're giving them. You, you really said a mouthful there. Now, at the time of your child's birth, you were given uh, a revelation from heaven as to how to raise this new creation. Can you talk a little bit more about that? <laughs> well, the universal answer to that question, I do believe, is no. No one's been given special revelation from heaven <laughs> about how to raise this particular child. And the Bible doesn't even give any clues that Mary got any special parenting instructions for baby okay. Jesus. So there's no model for that. So I don't believe that it exists. But there are clues, as I touched upon, from the moment of life. And is that child staying swaddled? How comfortable can he or she stay for periods of time? And Sometimes it is that child that's a little more difficult that you're going to find as they grow up, they're pushing back a little more. And pushback mm-hmm. doesn't hurt too much when they still don't have teeth. But when they start to push back at three or four, now you're starting to have a problem as a parent if you're not ready to deal with that strong-willed child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, what if the, the parent is uh, open-minded enough, they are able to observe that their, their children or their child is a little bit different than the other kids that are in the group. 
is it okay for them to talk to the, the nursery school teacher, the pre-K teacher, or the kindergarten teacher, or even the Sunday school teacher and kind of give a warning, hey, my kid might be a little bit of a handful. Is it okay for a parent to say those types of things to others? Well, it's okay to say, but I think instead of a just jumping right to the fact that, well, I've got to warn them about my child. Take a minute. Take a minute. Step back. Review what you've been doing with this child. I highly recommend picking up one of the great books that are out there about raising children, right? You Can't Make Me uh, by Cynthia Tobias is a fabulous book that can be found. Mm -hmm. Parenting the Strong-Willed Child by Doctors Forehand and Long, and that's another great tool that parents can read. And so rather than having to make excuses for your child, because when do you stop? When do you stop making excuses for your child? Wouldn't it be better to spend your time, your effort, I know you're working, you're tired, but find some tools to put in your toolkit so that when your little darling says to you with a gnarled face, Mom, I am not eating that macaroni and cheese, <laughs> you can find a way to navigate. Okay, I get it. No macaroni and cheese today, but tell me what you would like. Would you like fish sticks? Would you like whatever, and you name it. And you know what you're doing when you're, you're teaching your child to communicate with you. Rather than pushing back on you, you're teaching your child that you are open to communication. And I think that's one of the keys, actually, to helping this whole parenting task work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, there may be this parent out here, Bonnie, that's listening, and they're saying, okay, I hear what you're saying, but guess what? I was a strong-willed child, I am a strong-willed adult, and it's kind of my way or no way. Um, <laughs> I'm not giving in to that kid. I'm the parent. You know, we, we have some folks that are like that. So do you have any advice for that strong-willed parent dealing with that strong-willed child? Well, if you like... Uh, if you like rocks grinding together day after day, <laughs> right? If you are strong-willed yourself, you and your child will be like grinding stones. And unless as the adult you learn a few tricks. And I had to read a few books on raising strong-willed children because guess what I had? <laughs> strong-willed children. <laughs> and I actually sat on the front step when they were three and four and I was crying because their strong wills were already outdoing me. Okay, and mm -hmm. you have to realize that when that starts to happen, when you feel like you're losing the ship, I got news for you, you're losing the ship. So <laughs> get some tools in your, in your toolkit and start to learn even, I don't like to use the word force, but even force your strong-willed mm -hmm. child with love and grace that there is a way to communicate your needs as opposed to being brash. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Well, Bonnie, it is almost time for us to go to break. So if you would, please, can you remind everyone what is the title of your book, where can we pick up a copy, and how do we follow you online? Yes, I found myself in 11th grade, and I found I wasn't alone, and that's on Amazon, or you can find it at any online book retailer. And as I said, that, and as you had mentioned, that is written for young boys. I found that young boys, teenagers, they sometimes have really negative self-talk in their head. I found that from working on the psych ward, and so I really wanted to give a book that modeled a choice, right, a model, but you don't have to go down that road. Try these things. I'm all about choice and options. Um, you can find me online. I do have a Facebook page, Bonnie Nelson. I have a website, www.bonniennelson.com. There's quite a few ways that you can find me and get to me if you have questions. Alrighty, listeners, now you know where you can pick up a copy of the book. We'll be back right after this. Anne, Camilla, William, and Fred. The four in the Humvee are on a perilous journey, halfway across the country to a tent city near the Mississippi River, a long ways from Boston. Through each bend and turn, they meet some people in need and others who have evil in their souls. Four unlikely heroes in a Humvee on an unlikely trip. The recipe for a captivating story. Grab this book. EMP Casualty by Michael Kravitz. Hi everyone, Dr. Angela here. Did you know that Daily Spark is now on Facebook? 
That's right. You can visit with me at facebook.com forward slash daily spark with Dr. Angela. I want to know more about what you're thinking. I'd love to know which interview did you find the most entertaining or the most informative. I want to talk to you and I want you to be able to talk to me. Simply visit facebook.com forward slash daily spark with Dr. Angela. For Daily Spark with Dr. Angela, I am your host, Dr. Angela Butts-Chester. My guest today is Bonnie Nelson, and she has written the book, I Found Myself in 11th Grade, and I Found I Wasn't Alone. I love that title. Now, Bonnie, we were just talking about children that may have strong wills and what we can do if you happen to also be a strong-willed parent and how we can love our children through that moment. But what do we do? Or how do we understand unconditional love and strong boundaries? Do they have anything in common? Are they flip sides of the coin? How should we understand that? Well, certainly. And, again, that's a great question because strong boundaries are unconditional love. They're wrapped up like a boundary. But really, if you dig inside, it's unconditional love. Because in terms of raising your children, unconditional love, honesty, consistency, guiding, cheerleading, and being a great role model is a really great start. And then knowing your child, really knowing your child can help you parent your child in a way that best helps the child grow to his or her fullest potential, not your idea of what that should be. I have just a quick little story about a woman I work with. I haven't worked with her very long, but she has five children, and and her youngest child, she was exasperated with him. And, but he was a geek kind of a kid, 14 years old, very smart, and she was just every day, <laughs> smoke coming out of her ears every day. And then one day she went home, he had broke the most expensive part in his whole program that he uses, and everyone blew a gasket. But then when she got home, she realized he had taken the entire contraption apart on the dining room table, and it laid in two million pieces. And she said, are you going to be able to put this back together? He goes, Mom, of course. I wouldn't have taken it apart if I couldn't put it back together. Well, she had an aha moment. And she said with tears in her eyes, I had been pushing him, I realize now, down a different path because Mm -hmm. I wanted him to be like everybody else that I knew. And I realized yesterday as I looked at my dining room table that I was wrong. Mm-hmm. And I said, hallelujah, you had a revelation, <laughs> right? You had a revelation. That's awesome. And so I tell that story even so you know sometimes you can have smoke coming out of your ears, but you can still get a revelation about your child. And really mm-hmm. that's what you want to know. What is your child's passion? They may be excellent at math and lacrosse and football, but they may not love it. And so sometimes you even have mm-hmm. to help your children know Start thinking about what you really love to do. What sets you on fire? What gets you going every day? But most kids 14 can start to tell you, Mom, I really like it when I do this. Mom, I really feel successful when I sit down and I do this or that. So, again, it's communication. Let the child know that you are in this with them, right? This is their life, Mm -hmm. but you're in it with them, and you're willing to help them in any way necessary and legal to help them get where they're going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You really gave a great advice there because I have actually spoken to some adults that um, did not follow their true passion. They did what others believed was best for them, and now they have burnout, they're unhappy, they're miserable on their job because they didn't choose their path or they didn't accept the path that God had given to them and instead tried to be what everyone else wanted them to be. So thank you for reminding everyone of that. Well, when it comes to parenting, I think that most people will agree that they want to be great parents. They'll settle for good, but they want to be great parents. Is being a great parent going to guarantee that you have great kids? Oh, no, there's no guarantee. But have you ever asked your child to give you a scorecard, a little report card? You make it. You make up the report card. Oh, kids get a kick out of this. How am I? How's my, how's my cooking? 
Do you like the way your laundry comes out after I do your laundry? Do you like the way it smells? Would you like it to smell some other way? Right? It's silly. It's just silly stuff, but I'll tell you, kids eat it up. And what does that show your child? You're real. <laughs> you are real. Right? They, they just feel so much more connected to you when they realize that you are real. And once your children are older, teenagers, you can actually be even more communicative with them. Again, I, I have young kids around me all the time, and one boy was just he was stressed out about his mom. Oh, she's calling me again. I said, have you ever mm-hmm. thought about what's going on with your mom? He had just gotten his own job. No. I said, so how do you love your job? Oh, geez. He says, you know, I never get to drink a drink of water some days. I said, have you ever asked mm-hmm. your mom about her job? Well, not really. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know, it's up to you, but run up to Starbucks, maybe get a cup of coffee for her. I know she drinks coffee, and you get something to drink, and just sit down and have a conversation. And I'm telling you, it was remarkable. It was remarkable when the 16-year-old actually had a conversation with his mom. Mm -hmm. And she would say, I don't know how we got to this place, but it's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It really, it really and truly is, and I can, you know, raise my hand and say I have an awesome relationship with my now adult son, Um, but we always have, and people would uh, say, you guys are really great together. Like, you can tell that you are a mother and son that really care about each other, and you want what's best for each other. You know, um, being mindful about the other person that is in your family, I think, really and truly does matter. And to me, that's what you're speaking to. Are you mindful of what's going on in your mom's life? You may be having a bad day, but what about mom? Mom, you may be having a bad day, but what about your kid as well? So great, great point there. Now, do you believe that experiencing failure on any level, as well as um, situations dealing with rejection can make your child more resentful or do they help them understand who you are? Like you said, make you more real. What about that? Well, so when we're talking about um, experiencing failure or situational rejection, We're not talking about bullying. We're not talking about the bias that sometimes happens, unfortunately, in schools and families and in life. No one said life was fair. I'm sorry, and that's true. But situational rejection and failure is failing a test, not getting a job, not getting asked to the prom. This is life. And everything's not roses. And the sooner your kids get a clue about this, really, the better life will be for them. And I knew a very fine man who had, he was a wonderful man, a loving father. He loved all his children equally. And one day he said, he told me his eldest son was getting ready to look for a job. And he as the dad was going to drive to a few places and talk to the management and seem if they were willing to hire his 15, 16-year-old son. Mm -hmm. I was almost shaking my head, but I didn't. I said, why would you do that? Did your father Mm -hmm. do that for you? No, no, he said, but I don't want my son to suffer disappointment if no one hires him. I'll only drive him to the places where people indicate to me that they will hire him. Hmm. Children learn how to handle disappointment. Guess how? (laughs) By being disappointed, (laughs) right? I mean, Mm -hmm. it's a very Mm -hmm. easy equation, and rejection happens. Mm -hmm. But if the child is confident in their abilities, If someone says no, the child can have a level of maturity that says, okay, I'll ask someone else. Okay, I'll bang on another door. I'll ask another girl out. Next, right? Who's next? Who's Uh next can help me, right? And so, but what we have to stay away from is labeling, right? And this this is the big no. There's a big red circle and a red X around that word labeling. You can have things labeled in your cupboard, but absolutely do not label your children or anyone else's child for that matter. Mm-hmm. 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 And, you know, I'm so glad that you said that because there, there's someone who needs to either hear it for the first time or be reminded that our children learn about rejection by going through the rejection. Life is not always sunshine. There is some rain. There will be some no's. There may be more no's than yeses at a particular period in your life. So thank you so much for reminding people of that. Now, the next question that I want to ask you about is uh, about how we 
how we talk, how we speak to each other. Now, people that are my clients know that I talk about positive self-talk all the time. What are you saying to yourself? How are you speaking to others that are in your various circles? So my question to you is how powerful or how toxic are the things that could potentially come out of our mouths? We know that scripture addresses it. What do you say? <laughs> scripture sure does address that. I, I laugh at that every time I think about it. I'm like, God, do you know your people or what? <laughs> <laughs> and I've heard some really wonderful people say some terrible things to their kids. It's mm-hmm. always when anger is present. <laughs> it's never, it's always when there's a party and there's something going on and it's very busy and anger flares. So I guess if you know your triggers, right? Know your triggers. My right. trigger is lack of sleep. I don't have anger, but I have lack of sleep issues. So mm-hmm. if I'm going to be operating at the top of my game every day and keeping my mouth as clean as possible, and my mind, by the way, <laughs> my mind is mm-hmm. clean as possible, I know I need to get sleep. So know what your triggers are and know how to address your triggers and your self-care needs because that's going to go a long way to help what's coming out of your mouth. Because Absolutely. a damaging word, a damaging word is going to stick. It's going to mm-hmm. stick. And it's because of the subconscious. I say it's like that box of cards in the library. Your subconscious orders everything that happens to you. It's all there. It's not in your conscious mind, but it's in your subconscious mind. But you get seeds of bad things in your subconscious mind. And I've actually been to seminars where you've worked with relaxation and different Um, mostly relaxation and try to open up that subconscious a little bit and do cleaning of house while you can. Mm -hmm. And so just be aware that every word you're saying, you may well forget what you said Friday by Monday, (laughs) but it's been cataloged. Okay? Okay. It's been cataloged. Mm -hmm. So just just try to be mindful. And like I said, self-care for yourself as the parent is really, really, really important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it kind of doubles back to what you said earlier about the seeds that are planted. Uh, so many times, even when you talk to adults about negative things that have been said to them, they will remember the negative things that were said when they were five, when they were 15, when they were 20, that the negativity, the root tend to run really deep, where people tend to keep the compliment almost in shallow ground. They remember it, but they don't remember it. But that one painful statement could really be a dagger in the heart that someone carries around for quite some time. So, yes, you, wow, that's a, that's a really great reminder. Well, do you believe that you can learn new skills on how to parent when it comes to your child. Maybe maybe your parents weren't the best parents in the world and you want to do something a little bit different or you've had that epiphany moment and you realize, I was kind of doing it wrong a couple of years ago. I now want to get it right. Well, there's um, a saying about the learner, right? The person who's ready to learn, the teacher will always be there. And so I think It's never too late to learn new skills. And that being said, before the child gets to middle school, you would really have your best chance of correcting the record or changing course from a relationship perspective. Because at the age of 10 to 13, ecocentricity begins to um, develop in your child right? Mm-hmm. And that, that's mm-hmm. a very important stage in children. So I just want you to remember that age 10 to 13, I'm going to call it hallowed ground for lack of a better word, but by the <laughs> time 10 and 13, you've really got to think of that child as walking in hallowed ground because they are now forming who they will be as an adult. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now I have one more story. That this is, um, God, I hope she never hears your... <laughs> She never hears a radio station show. But anyway, we've been friends for a long time. And she had a difficult mother, and she didn't have an easy childhood, but she had a beautiful child. And he's, guess what, strong-willed. Yes, anyway, she never read the book, Strong-Willed Child. But nevertheless, so she popped into my kitchen last month, and she was in near hysteria. And I said, are you okay? What's the matter? And she said, I feel awful. I said the worst thing to my son. I called him a blank. I said, oh, dear, how is he, I asked. I was concerned about him. 
How is mm-hmm. he? Oh, her son, he kicked up the blanket off in the birthing room. I was there. I mean, but mom, I can't believe you called me up. That mm-hmm. is disgusting. I'm telling dad. <laughs> well, I said, you know what? I can only tell you one thing. You need to go home right now and you need to give your son the control of the soap while he washes out your mouth. And she looked at me in horror, and I said, look, (laughs) drastic bad requires drastic correction. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It worked. She apologized, Mm -hmm. reminded him how very much she loves him, and promised it would never happen again. And no one except his father would be told of the incident and outcome, because she's pretty well known where she lives. (laughs) Mom, can I just tell my best friend, you know, (laughs) what you did, but more importantly, what you did to make it right? Just your one friend, she said sheepishly. Well, we laughed that her little darling, when he's older and is on the high school soccer team, his team might hear about it, his girlfriend might hear about it, but I told her certainly his wife and your grandchildren are going to know about that day. (laughs) (laughs) She goes, if that word still exists, I'm like, "Uh, to be honest, I don't ever foresee that word disappearing from our English language. But anyway, that... I mean, I really hope that doesn't happen to any of our listeners. I mean, that's a pretty Mm -hmm. demoralizing thing to have happen. But Mm -hmm. sometimes your children will even lead you to correction. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And don't resist. Mm -hmm. If your children, and, 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 you know, apology goes a long way. Even the woman with all of the parts on the dining room table that I talked about Mm -hmm. earlier, she apologized to her 14-year-old for missing it. Mm-hmm. And she said mm-hmm. that was a very, you know, so apologies, we can't forget to apologize. We have to humble ourselves and put ourselves in the other's shoes and always be hopeful. Always mm-hmm. be hopeful that change can happen, that you are living and breathing today, and so you will be able to learn new things and just remind yourself what a great parent you're striving to be. Give yourself a lot of grace and give your children even more grace. I love it. And what a great note to end our interview on. I tell you, what a great, great day today. We have definitely learned a lot. Well, you know, then, thank you so much for being on Daily Spark with Dr. Angela today. If you can, one more time, please, remind everyone what is the title of your book, where we can pick up a copy, and how can we follow you online? Yes, certainly. The title of my book for teenage boys is I Found Myself in 11th Grade and I Found I Wasn't Alone. Gracie Girl in Africa, Into Africa, is coming out next month. You can find me on Facebook, Bonnie Nilsson, N-I-L-S-S-O-N, or my website is www.bonnienilsson.com. And there I have a skills assessment is great if you know what your values are, and this is something that kids can do with their siblings or parents can do with their children. In the book Gracie Girl, the book opens with Gracie's mom bringing home one of these values assessments, and she said it just showed me that my family was a tapestry of different values, and she saw where she sort of plugged in, for lack of a better term. But I think sometimes getting things like that to do with your family, um, Gary Chapman's book about uh, the love language, that's another great tool that parents can use to learn how does your children like to be loved. And in mm-hmm. this book, I found myself, I did talk about um, one of the children, they all knew that Emma liked to have a party thrown for her. That was how she felt loved. Her brother, Mm -hmm. on the other hand, only wanted a pat on the back was the most positive way to reinforce love with him. So there's some really great reading material out there that can help you as you endeavor to be the best parent you can be. And I think you'll have a lot of fun doing it. I love it. Thank you again, Bonnie, for being on the show today. Thank you, Dr. Angela. God bless. And listeners, thank you as well. And as always, May God continue to shine his face upon you. May you receive his grace and his mercy in all that you do. Until next time, everyone, be blessed in the Lord. Bye-bye.